Wait, how does this work? You just press the button. This one? No, not that one. <laughs> You're listening to Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. Everything seems impossible to what happens. Everyone would be affected by a nuclear war. Our government is planning to spend trillions of dollars to develop new nuclear weapons that we don't need. You can't win a nuclear war. We are all experts on nuclear weapons because we are all going to be affected by those nuclear weapons. And here are your hosts, Joe Cirincioni and Michelle Dover. Welcome back to our 44th episode of Press the Button. We have a full show for you today. We're starting off with early warning, as usual. This time we're looking at the most recent op-ed in the New York Times about whether or not the president should extend New Start. It was a pretty incredible op-ed. Yes, by Madeleine Albright, our former Secretary of State, and by Igor Ivanov, the former Rus- Foreign Minister for Russia. I can't remember a more important group of senior validators warning us about the arms race and begging us to... Uh, save the last remaining arms control treaty. We'll follow that by examining the latest on America's newest, most usable nuclear weapon now found on a submarine near you. The news of Donald Trump's nuclear weapon spending binge is just remarkable. He is proposing to spend over $60 billion on nuclear weapons and related programs. And as our friend and colleague Stephen Schwartz points out, that is more in inflation-adjusted dollars than we spent in 1990 as the Cold War was ending. And then we'll follow that up with a question and answer, which today comes from a listener in Germany who sent us his question on Twitter. You too can have your questions read and answered on the show. If you follow us on Twitter, we're at press button pod. Just send us a question via tweet or DM. The interview is something special today. We're going to look at what a feminist foreign policy would mean for nuclear policy. Last week, we gathered nuclear experts in our Plowshares Fund conference room here to discuss gender equity in the field. And we had a presentation by Lyric Thompson, the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the International Center for Research on Women. Uh, She was so remarkable, it was so interesting that we just dragged her in uh, to our table here in our glass enclosed headquarters and, and, and had a fascinating discussion with her. We thought it was fascinating. Take a listen, see what you think. Lyric is just, you know, a remarkable researcher and advocate. Um, She's spent time working with UN bodies, with various countries, um, working to end gender-based violence, working uh, to figure out what gender equity means for foreign policy. We really think you're going to like this interview. And her organization is top-notch. You can check them out at icrw.org. But as always... Please take a listen, and if you like what you hear, give us a rating, a review, or a share. Your feedback is a huge help to us. The clock is ticking. Let's go. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Del. Today, I'm joined by Tom Kalina, Policy Director here at Plowshares Fund, and our special guest, Hans Christensen, the Director of the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. Gentlemen, you know the drill. Our seven minutes to cover the world's nuclear news starts now. Tom, today the New York Times published an op-ed by former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and former Russian Foreign Minister Igor Ivanov calling on President Trump to extend New START, saying the treaty's agreed limits on nuclear arsenals are too important to be put at risk in a game of nuclear chicken. Why would two former foreign ministers of their stature weigh in now? Thanks, Michelle. This was a tremendously important uh, op-ed and a tremendously important statement Uh, by the Aspen Ministers Forum, uh, 26 former foreign ministers, weighing in on the importance of extending the New START Treaty because we are now one year away from the treaty expiring. Uh, Last week was our wake-up call of the one-year mark. Uh, We only have one year left to save this treaty from from expiring, and and the time is now and the clock is ticking. And, you know, it takes a while to do these kind of things. Uh, You can't just turn around these things on a dime particularly with a Trump administration that is reluctant to extend New START. Uh, From President Trump's perspective, this is an Obama treaty, uh, much like the Iran nuclear deal. He doesn't see the policy importance of it. He sees the political downside 
of endorsing a treaty that his predecessor um, created. So this is a real political problem that we need to deal with it, but uh, we can't lose sight of the fact that this treaty is tremendously important in terms of limiting U.S. and Russian nuclear forces. It's the last standing agreement that does that. If we lose this treaty, we will lose these limits um, that we've had for the last 50 years. Uh, so this is a big deal. We need the Trump administration to focus on this. And I think we need President Trump to see this as a political win for him, if he can seem presidential by meeting with President Putin and extending this treaty. I think that's the way for him to think about it. And again, this is a no-brainer logistically. Both presidents just need to sign on the dotted line and agree to extend it. Uh, no Senate ratification is necessary. No legislators need to weigh in. This is a simple thing to do. It's a no-brainer. We just need to get it done. So that's the state of the treaty world. Hans, on January 29th, you and Bill Arkin reported that the U.S. Navy has now deployed the new W-76-2 Trident submarine warhead, a low-yield nuclear weapon. The Navy then confirmed this last week through a statement by Under Secretary of Defense John Rood. First of all, congrats on the scoop. Thank you. Second, why would the Navy deploy these now? Well, they believe they need to have a weapon that is um, more convincing uh, to the Russians that we're actually use it. So this raises two overall issues. Uh, one, of course, is about U.S. intentions for using nuclear weapons. The other one has to do with how adversaries perceive U.S. intentions. And so on the first one, it's clear, at least to me, that we're building this. The reason we go through the trouble of building this is because we want to signal that we are willing to use nuclear weapons from ballistic missile submarines in a way we did not before. And so this is a worrisome new development. Um, it's, a, it's a slide toward uh, a nuclear war fighting scenario. And I don't mean that entirely as in the Cold War sense of nuclear firing, of course, but a greater willingness to, to, to rub the nuclear uh, weapon in the noses of, of adversaries. And the other one is about what those adversaries think. Um, and of course, uh, when we're saying that's what we're doing and we're deploying it and uh, we spend the money doing it and we think it's important and more weapons are coming that have characteristics similar to that, then it tells them that the United States is moving in a direction where um, it is more willing to use nuclear weapons. So both the United States, by doing this, and the Russians, by doing their own dirty work, <laughs> are sort of rubbing nuclear weapons in each other's noses again. Uh, and that is a very dangerous development. Tom, you just described how treaties are fraying. Hans, you're talking about the new weapons systems that are coming online and what it means for nuclear risk in the world today. And you also mentioned the cost. Axios is reporting today that President Trump will be requesting a nearly 20% increase over his previous budget request for modernizing the nuclear arsenal. This will include a warhead life extension program as well as developing new nuclear weapons. Is this increase justified? No, it's not. I mean, what we see is we're in a new arms race now, and there's two dimensions to this. One is losing the limits on the arsenals that we have, and the other is spending you know, tens of billions of dollars to develop new weapons that not only are we doing, but the Russians are doing as well. Uh, and you see that in, uh, you know, now that INF treaty is gone, we're building weapons that previously were prohibited by INF, but now we can go ahead uh, and build them. Uh, the Russians have their set of new weapons that they want to build. Uh, but, you know, the good news is that we don't have to build all these weapons. I mean, we're rebuilding these weapons as if the Cold War never ended. In fact, it did 30 years ago. So it's about time that we stopped and said, do we still need all this? And in fact, there's one of these new weapons, the new land-based ballistic missile, um, is not worth the money. In fact, I wouldn't want it even if it were free because it actually reduces the security uh, in the world and it makes uh, the world more dangerous. So there are a lot of ways that we can save money, uh, and that's good because we can't afford to do all of this. And of course, this news is also coming on top of the Congressional Budget Office's report that's predicting that the U.S. deficit will top $1 trillion annually over the next 10 years, ultimately reaching $1.7 trillion in 2030. How do you think Congress will respond? <laughs> Well, um, there'll be a lot of debate about whether they can afford it. And um, I think uh, a lot of people in Congress, I fear, will cave into this simplistic argument that has been presented over the last many years, that it's a question about everything or nothing. You know, the whole triad or nothing. Modernization or no modernization. So these kind of black and white 
uh, sort of straw man arguments that are trying to set up a very difficult situation so people go along. And I think that's an unfortunate dynamic, but it's for real. But you know, we and many others have argued for many, many years, for a decade, uh, that there were affordability issues in the uh, nuclear modernization plan that Congress and the military had to face. They have to relate to it. And of course, we were told again and again, no, 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 nuclear weapons are very cheap. Oh, this is not a problem. And so here we are. We are facing a situation where there's a deepening competition between nuclear modernization and requirements for conventional uh, weapons modif modifications as well. So I don't know how they're going to resolve that, but there's not more money in the pot, so they got to cut somewhere. Hans, Tom, our time is up. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. Now the segment where I ask Joe a question he has not seen. Joe, are you ready for this? I always get a little nervous over these things. <laughs> Go ahead, shoot. Today's question is from Frank. Frank writes, Hey there, I'm an avid listener from Germany, and I was wondering whether you could address NATO nuclear sharing in one of your next episodes. Hmm. Does it still make sense from a strategic perspective? Here in Germany, a majority wants U.S. nukes out of the country, but the government has a different opinion on this matter. Germany is also in the process of purchasing a new fighter bomber as a replacement for the aging tornadoes, and it is clear that a new aircraft must be able to carry B-61 nuclear bombs. So, another take on the, on the budget angle and the strategic angle. Joe, does it make sense? Well, nuclear sharing... Um you know, it made sense during the Cold War when we had a very large force and we were afraid that Russia was going to invade Western Europe and we thought that we couldn't defeat these Warsaw Pact tank armies that would plow through the Fulda Gap. I can't tell you how much time I spent as a staffer on the House Armed Services Committee worrying about exactly this scenario. It turns out we overestimated the Soviet conventional forces and we deployed an insane amount of nuclear weapons to counter them, including thousands of so-called battlefield nukes. So the part of the nuclear sharing starts with that concern that Frank has. We have 150 um, hydrogen bombs, so-called tactical nuclear weapons that range from a fraction of the size of the bomb we dropped on Hiroshima to 10, even 20 times larger than the Hiroshima bomb. And we were going to drop these on allied territories. We were going to drop these in Germany, which explains why the Germans... Listeners can't see the look on my face of sheer horror. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, uh, Colin Powell writes in his uh, autobiography uh, uh, that when he was a, assigned to a nuclear battalion, an artillery battalion, and he was told of this plan, he thought it was absolutely insane and swore that he would do something uh, if he ever had the chance, and he did. Years later, in 1991, he denuclearized the U.S. Army and got rid of a lot of these, but there's 150 left, and they're, in, they're stored in Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Belgium, and really stupidly in Turkey, 50 nuclear weapons in, in, in Turkey stored about 100 miles from the Syrian border. No, this policy doesn't make sense. The Soviets are gone. The Russians are not going to invade. We do not need nuclear weapons. Uh, we can get rid of these. Even if you don't believe, as we do, that we should eliminate all our nuclear weapons, that the U.S. should never use nuclear weapons first, and you believe that we should have at our disposal some sort of battlefield nuclear weapon, we have a thousand of them stored in depots uh, in the United States. We can fly them over in hours to a battlefield any place in the world. No, we could save a lot of money and reduce the risks of storing nuclear weapons, particularly in volatile regions like Turkey, by just getting rid of these last 150 nuclear weapons. Uh, that would be my recommendation to the next president. Just pull the plug, get rid of them. I swear to God, the NATO allies are not going to freak out about this. They will feel better knowing that they don't have this contentious issue to deal with with their, their populations. Another week, another question. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Frank.
One of the great things about doing this podcast is when we hear really interesting people say really interesting things, we can just drag them from our conference room into our office. Literally. <laughs> put them in front of a microphone and just start talking to them. So I was just brought into a meeting that Michelle and Kara Wagner had organized uh, on a feminist foreign policy, and I got to meet our guest today, uh, Lyra Thompson, who is the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the International Center for research on women, who is working on a, a very ambitious project toward a feminist foreign policy in the United States. And we're gonna take that apart and then put it back together for you in 20 minutes. I promise we can do this. Lyric, thank you so much for sitting down with us. It's such a pleasure, thanks for the invitation. Let's just start off uh, on, on what is a feminist foreign policy? What do you mean by that? Sure. So in 2014, Sweden launched the world's first feminist foreign policy uh, to, as then Foreign Minister Margo Wallström would say, giggles and suspicion. And then nothing really happened for several years. Um, and so we didn't really have an answer beyond what Sweden's doing is a feminist foreign policy until um, more recently uh, countries including Canada, France, Luxembourg, and Mexico have published iterations of or declared that they intend to publish iterations of feminist foreign policy. So at the International Center for Research on Women, we've been very interested in what is a feminist foreign policy, distilling some global standard or definition, and then situating within that context what would a very detailed proposal look like for the United States. Um, and the reason we wanted to do that work is because there hasn't been a consistent definition to date. There haven't been core principles, there's no template, and so we worried, as we do, um, that there would be potentially a scenario where countries would just not change anything they were doing and say, well, our, our foreign policy is feminist now. And so we got the best and brightest um, researchers, advocates, and thinkers about what should feminist foreign policy be together to answer that question. So the paper you're holding in front of you is our um, current draft of what this would look like in the United States, and it assumes three things. One, that it's not just about women. It's about hmm. broader definitions of gender equality, of evening out hills and valleys between sexes, not being binary in that approach, being what's called intersectional, which is to say taking a power-based analysis of how our foreign policy impacts people around the world and people within our own country, and looking at intersections between race, gender, age, mobility, ethnicity. Um, that is the first piece. Goals being we want a peaceful planet, we want environmental integrity, we want gender equality. Secondly, we want it to also apply to all of the streams of foreign policy in the United States, which is to say Canada, for example, only looked at development assistance. Wait, wait, wait. let me interrupt just for a second. So Canada had or has? Has. A feminist international assistance policy. So very narrowly focused on its international assistance. Uh -huh. We want more. We want the sweet, what was the Swedish model, now also Mexican model, of this is about diplomacy, it's about defense. Yes, it's about development assistance, but you don't have to be a donor country to do feminist foreign policy. Of course, the US is a donor country. It's about trade. And so we want a coherent approach that articulates what are you going to do differently toward those goals, and how are you going to apply it across all streams of foreign policy, and how are you going to do that in a manner that is co-created and consults feminists both inside government inside the United States, and the, the women who are ultimately going to be impacted by these policies. So this was actually one of my questions. What does a feminist foreign policy mean for defense? Or for what, you know, some of us who work in this space, it's often called hard security, which I think there's probably a lot to unpack there. Um, how are you thinking about it in terms of areas that involve the military, that involve arms sales? What have you found so far? So there's antecedents of this that exist in US foreign policy today, uh, most popularly encapsulated in what's known as the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda and relevant policies. So starting with the Obama administration, there was the National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. Um, subsequently, there's been legislation and also a Trump administration strategy that was required by said legislation. Um, so this isn't 
a brand new, it's not that nobody's ever done this thinking. In fact, there's a, you know, a 20 year this year history of that, um, starting with UN Security Council Resolution 1325. Um, so within that agenda, there's everything from how are we um, protecting women in times of war? How are we including women in our um, both prevention as well as peace building efforts? How are we making sure that when we're doing post-conflict reconstruction, we're not just assuming male breadwinners or male uh, ex-combatants? How are we thinking about how there will be spikes in domestic violence as fighters are coming home? These sorts of questions, making that de rigueur in our um, defense and security policy and practices. And you think we don't do that now in the United States? We are iterating ever further toward those goals. We have at least articulated through both executive and legislative policy actions that we intend to. Uh -huh. But we regularly find that those <laughs> goals are coming up short in our practice. The most recent and obvious example of this was US brokered peace talks in Afghanistan, which despite taking place just after the legislation was passed and just before the Trump administration published its strategy on the same that articulated that women need to be involved in peace talks, uh, this didn't happen. Uh -huh. Now, my experience with this field is that it's it basically has grown out of sort of the, the peace and conflict resolution and development world of security. So that's why we're talking about things like resolving the, the, these conflicts, how do wars start, how do we prevent wars. A lot of the stuff we focus on at Plowshares is about what Michelle has called hard security, budgets, weapons, um, nu the posture of the nuclear forces of the United States. Have you started to look at that part of the defense and foreign policy world? With your help, uh, <laughs> starting today, uh, that conversation has been uh, co-curated, thanks to you, um, alongside also uh, New America and Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security. And that discussion this morning was everything from um, disarmament to sanctions to all the things that you know far better than I know. Um, and the goal of these iterative consultations on this kind of opening salvo that we've presented yeah. in this paper is to further refine and add elements that are aligned um, and, and can reinforce the same general foreign policy goals. I think one of the things that I took away from um, the discussion draft and, and how you're thinking about a feminist foreign policy is the full life cycle of foreign policy, which I'm not sure huh. I had really thought about before. No, what do you mean? Um, in the sense of, you know, it, if you start, let's say, from where we're at and talking about the weapon systems, what do those weapon systems actually do to the people who are on the receiving end? Uh -huh. What do those consequences mean for our aid programs, our conflict prevention programs? And how does that affect immigration or refugee movements? And, and how decisions at any point in this cycle affect other points of the cycle? And so getting out of our metaphorical silos Right. To talk about this and understand what our policies mean for other parts of foreign policy, I think was, you know, f at least for me, really enlightening. Right. So one of the comments I took away from the discussion was uh, somebody pointed out that nuclear weapons are almost the complete antithesis of what you're going for with the feminist foreign policy. These are in hugely indiscriminate weapons that 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 kill civilians in large numbers for very nebulous security reasons or gains. So that's the kind of thing you're now looking to tackle. Yes, I will say that uh, in the first iteration of the paper, there was a healthy emphasis on prioritizing diplomatic solutions before uh, military ones. Um, and so I think that a number of the principles and uh, postures that we are coming from in this paper seem to be very aligned to those that you all are speaking about in a much more focused and, and narrow or slice of foreign right, policy. Right, so let's make a deal with Iran rather than let's go to war with Iran. Exactly. What I think this morning's discussion did was it gave us the benefit of saying, and also see the following seven sub-bullets on how nuclear policy would be different under a feminist so foreign policy. Who are you to do this? Who, who, wh why, are you, why should we pay attention to what you think 
about U.S. foreign policy. Who is the International Center for Research on Women? We are a 40-year-old research institute that has uh, was born out of the first world, the first UN conference on women, um, and said, you know what? Most of the data that we have about how the world works is gender blind. Assumes, uh, you know, all of our health studies, all of our economic uh, development programs uh, are not asking the question: Are women being taken into account? Are women experiencing these things similarly? So we proceeded to assemble the best and brightest public health specialists, international human rights lawyers, et cetera, feminist economists who could answer those questions huh. and create an evidence base on that. That's who we are. But this <laughs> proposal is not merely an ICRW proposal. The goal of our effort has been to consult as widely as possible with feminists in countries all over the world either who have pushed for feminist foreign policies successfully in the countries that have them, who are on the receiving end of feminist foreign policies in either development assistance or diplomatic relations, et cetera, and to say, what should feminist foreign policy look like? And specifically, how would the United States do foreign policy differently? So if you'll see the acknowledgments page there, these are not ICRW's ideas. These are the ideas that have been curated and collated and put on paper by staff at the International National Center for Research on Women, but really try to distill uh, a number mm -hmm. of diverse expertise in the foreign policy spectrum from climate to defense to diplomacy, health, you name it. And when's this paper going to come out? In March, Women's Month, which is when we do everything like this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so literally on imminently. March 8th? <laughs> <laughs> no, March 8th is a Sunday, I believe. Oh, okay. Um, so we're targeting the first week of March. There will be a, a, a rollout on Capitol Hill. Um, and the final version of this paper that will have the benefit of all of the great ideas that you and colleagues were able to put forward this morning um, will be available for further interrogation and discussion after that. And then what happens after the paper? What do you do with the paper? I always argue with experts here in Washington that they, they do the paper and they think their job is done. They publish the report, right? No. No. It's just beginning. It's un unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I think we take a week off after the paper <laughs> and then we go back to there's a legislative agenda that needs to underpin this. We, there's a legislative land, landscaping exercise that needs to look at what are current bills that are already doing pieces of this that we need to know about. What would a larger authorizing bill look like? Mapping the committees of jurisdiction for this thing is going to be a nightmare. Um, getting further comment, fleshing out further. If we are successful, this is this amuse-bouche of this agenda that is the starter kit for someone who's coming in, you know, day one and saying, what is a feminist foreign policy and what would that look like? But then presumably there would be a 100-day agenda. There would be agency outreach um, for each of these actions. There would be a press strategy. There will be a press strategy. Um, and all of that, I think, is imminent um, and potentially even more imminent than I thought. I think we may end up moving on some of the legislative proposals this year. So you're working with champions in Congress n now? Mm -hmm. If people want to read the document we're talking about, where do they go? It is currently on www.icrw.org. Um, which is I -R I -C -R -W, um, which is the International Center for Research on Women's website. It's also on several partner websites, including Oxfam and Smash Strategies. We'd be happy for you to put it on yours if you'd like. Um, but wait, maybe, and do the final version, which will have your stuff in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's great. How did you get involved in all this? When's, what's the first time you heard the phrase feminist foreign policy. When then Foreign Minister Wallström said the words feminist foreign policy. Well, where were you at that time? Uh, I was still at the International Center for Research on Women. Wow. Um, and we've it's been kind of percolating on our back burner of we'd really love to do research and advocacy on this, but it's hard to do research on a sample of one. So we've been waiting for there to be more countries who would so boldly you know, go forward and call something feminist. And now we're in a situation where there's a handful and two of which are our neighbors. So I just look forward to the infographic that has, you know, green Canada and green Mexico and red United States with some sort of pithy communications language about how we're next. And here's the playbook. 
so what I find so striking about this work is how it really is looking at what trying to in, trying to imagine what this world is that we want to see and what that positive vision is in a moment where a lot of the things that we're seeing is opposition to certain policies. This is a very positive document and vision. For you, what's been the most surprising thing in this journey of both seeing feminist foreign policies evolve in real time and this extensive consultation effort that you've done? How willing people are to run with us on this journey with huh. very limited resources. And I think that's a couple of things. One, because something as broad and bold and ambitious as a feminist foreign policy is necessarily a, um, a attractive vehicle for a number of progressive proposals for foreign policy change. So being intersectional is inviting a bigger tent than we typically have. And that's been certainly the funnest part of this work for me is being able to get to know you all and get to know people in the trade space and all of these sorts of things that every time we have a consultation, someone else raises their hand and says, but you forgot X and I'd be happy to do the work to organize the consultation and get the experts together in a room to do it. Well, let me talk as one organizer to another. You, do you consider yourself an organizer? Absolutely. Absolutely. Me too. We, there, are, there are a number of anti-nuclear weapons groups in the country who do work, but it's our view that we're never going to see another mass anti-nuclear movement like we had during the 80s or that we had it during the 50s or at various points in, in the nuclear age. But that's okay. We don't have to because what we have right now is one of the biggest mass movements we've ever seen in, in the United States, millions of people engaged in the civic life of this country in, in women's issues, on uh, w racial issues, on environmental issues, on climate change issues. There's millions of people in motion. So what we need to do as those concerned about nuclear weapons is to bring this issue into those movements. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a viable strategy? Do you think, how, how, when I say this to you as someone who doesn't do nukes, who's working on this, does that seem like it would fit that this is possible, that these issues would be taken up by the feminist foreign policy, those in favor of a feminist foreign policy, and become enshrined as sort of one of the, 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 the planks of that policy? It seems to me that they're very deeply aligned. The goals that we've articulated in this paper for a feminist foreign policy are to advance peace, gender equality, and environmental integrity. I learned that there's been some work done on nuclear policy and gender, but I would say it sounds like not as much as there has been on uh, nuclear policy and environmental integrity and nuclear policy and peace. So while I would argue, and it seems that you would argue, that three of those three goals are aligned, there's at least a body of work um, that seems fairly well established to me on two out of three um, and aligns very nicely. A part of you know, building on what Joe said when it comes to organizing and, and our approach to, you know, reducing nuclear threats and engaging with others. You know, we want to bring our issue to others, but also recognize we have to carry the issues of those that we join with. What would you look for nuclear experts to be, to do in, in picking up a feminist foreign policy? What they did this morning, I was surprised. You asked everyone to come prepared to say what they would want a feminist foreign policy to be. And I thought there would be a lot more opting out or taking issue with that moniker in particular. So it seems to me that the work is already being done, which is be an ally, uh, understand the connections, and then make them. Huh. In your draft, you say, quote, now more than ever, the United States needs a feminist approach, one that fundamentally alters the way the nation conducts itself. And then you go on to explain that this would mean in a manner that prioritizes gender equality and environmental integrity, enshrines the human rights of all, seeks to disrupt colonial, racist, patriarchal and male-dominated power structures and allocate significant resources, including research, to achieve that vision. There's a lot to unpack there. I happen to agree with all that, so, so I think I'm an advocate of a feminist foreign policy. The Trump administration will not agree with any of that. What do you think the appetite is on the, in, on the Democratic side of the candidates that are running about whether they'd be open to this kind of approach? So I will, uh, I will 
caveat that the International Center for Research on Women is a nonprofit 501c3 organization that does not engage in political campaign activity. And neither do we. I will say that there are co-authors and organizers on that list who are engaged in C4 and other capacities with political campaign activity and would be able to answer this question more astutely. But I would say just in terms of the general moment in which we see everything from the Women's March to the Climate March to, uh, as you uh, hearken to this moment of unprecedented mass mobilization and uh, demand for change, um, that seems to be the thrusts of the case that these candidates, many if not all, are making in terms of foreign policy. Will they call it feminist? Unclear. And at the end of the day, it seems to me that there's a, a two different campaigns here in terms of do you take the good ideas that are articulated in the paper uh -huh. and then what do you call it? I'm agnostic on what they call it. I'm calling it feminist foreign policy because that is consistent with the drumbeat of policies that we're seeing that are being called feminist coming from other nations. But if that ultimately becomes an organizing tool to get press attention or to get people to come to a meeting on what is the intersection between nuclear and feminist foreign policy, um, but then whatever future administration doesn't actually use the F word, I still think we've won. <laughs> That's great, the F word. <laughs> okay. Oh, I do have one last question. Can you tell us what your day's been like in Washington? What was your day like today? What was it, what's it like to be you in Washington today? It was a great day. I started the day with you all uh, talking about nukes and feminist foreign policy, and I learned a whole great deal. Um, I made people laugh. I didn't make anyone cry, I don't think, which is good. Yeah, that I saw. Um, and I would say it was a more audible and engaged conversation than most of the consultations have been, which is a good indication to me that people are thinking their juices are flowing. Yeah, and then uh, so what? that's energizing. Uh, then I had uh, lunch with one of my co-authors, Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins of Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security, uh, to talk about next steps in both the legislative and executive proposals that we have here. Um, and then I briefed her community of members on where we've gone with this to date and opportunities for them to engage. And now you're doing the podcast with us. What's next for you? I'm making the case to Human Rights Watch that they need to endorse a feminist foreign policy for the United States. Go ahead. And then I'm going to the Hill to uh, have a reception to end Trump's global gag rule. Wow. Uh, tomorrow morning? Tomorrow morning, we're working on a, oh, we have an all-staff meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. <laughs> and then uh, I am doing my edits from the basis of these consultations. Well, Lyric Thompson, thank you so much for coming in and taking some of what is ex an extraordinarily busy uh, two days here in Washington for you. And um, we want to thank the International Center for Research on Women. Just let me add, Lyric, my thanks for your work on this and for helping us build a new world and, and a better vision for it. Good luck to us. Good luck to us. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil, Zach Brown, Derek Sender, Alex Beyer, and Will Lowry. Sound design by Derek Sender. Audio engineering by Derek Sender and Will Lowry. Research by Alex Spire. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.